Hi everyone, uh, welcome to uh, Magnet Seminar uh, from the Magnets team. Uh, today I'm really happy to uh, to have James Bryson to uh, to this seminar. I would like just to remind everybody that the format is typically 25 minutes presentation followed by Q and A time, and there is a time where then it's not recorded for a, a catch up that you're welcome to stay. Um, so today we have James Bryson from University of Oxford in the UK uh, presenting uh, the talk entitled Elucidating Early Solar System Evolution Using the Magnetism of Carbonaceous Chondrites. Uh, thanks, James, please um, go ahead and share your screen. The floor is yours. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. Can everyone you. see my screen? Yes, that's fine. Thank you very much. Excellent. So thank you for that introduction and, and thank you for inviting me to speak today. I'm really excited about, about giving this talk. So during just the first four to five million years following the ignition of our sun, our solar system underwent a profound transformation from this chaotic protoplanetary disk of dust and gas, I'm showing an example of here on the left, into an organized system of planetary bodies. And the behavior of each planet in our solar system including their ability to or to not support life, can trace its origins back to the processes involved in this transformation. So the phenomena and the behaviors operated in our protoplanetary disk set the scene for each planetary evolutionary pathway. And the reason the Earth looks the way it does today is because of the process of its formation. And that's true with every planet in our solar system, or indeed any exoplanetary system as well. Now, there are several phenomena that govern how the disk behaves, and one of them is this vast magnetic field that threaded the disk. This material is made up of dust and gas, and that can become ionized by solar radiation and cosmic rays, and that material is moving around. So similar to the dynamo today, he creates a vast magnetic field. Now, unlike the geodynamo, actually measuring this magnetic field directly today is really difficult. A, because our protoplanetary disk that our solar system came from dissipated four or five million years after the sun ignited, so four and a half billion years ago. And when we do have these telescope images of other disks, it's really difficult to isolate uh, the contributions that we're seeing from their magnetic fields. But there are some sort of very basic fundamental bits of physics about how protoplanetary disks behave. And by looking at certain force balances, we can predict broadly what the magnetic field must have looked like um, based on the, the sort of the the key principles about how these objects behave. And I'm, I'm going to caveat this by saying there's several models and, and they do vary, but they all have sort of certain commonalities. And what I'm showing here is a prediction of, of one of these models. So to start with, they all vary by orders of magnitude as a function of distance away from the sun. So uh, zero astronomical units is the sun, one astronomical a one AU astronomical unit by definition is where Earth is, and then Neptune is out at 30. Uh, so we're seeing this variation by orders of magnitude uh, between Earth and where Jupiter is today at 5 AU. We broadly have planetary strength magnetic fields inside the disk itself between 10 and 100 microtesla. And then we uh, all the models also show that we have large or strong magnetic fields close to the sun and weak magnetic fields far away from the sun. And this is simply a result of the fact that we have high densities of dust and gas near the star and low densities of dust and gas far away. As we see this exponential decay in the density of dust and gas, we have an exponential decay in the intensity of the magnetic field as well. Now, this prediction predates these groundbreaking observations that we've been measuring over the last seven years or so using the ALMA telescope. And what these are showing is that these disks were not smoothly varying objects. They've got these, these rings in them. And this prediction, the magnetic field density, just can't, cannot include these rings because they're just not part of the model. In reality, what we might expect is a magnetic field profile that looks more something like this. Now, this is just a hypothetical example I created for this talk. But you can see it's got these variations in um, magnetic field maxima and minima that reflect where we have pressure maxima and minima. Now, the really exciting thing about this is that spinning out of these ALMA telescope observations are this suite of new models of planet formation that have really started to get over the problems that we've been having for the last 30 years in planet building. And they basically 
seemingly solved it if there are places in our protoplanetary disk where we had above canonical pressures of dust and gas. Uh, and we do see these in these disks. But probing these pressure maxima is really difficult when we look uh, at meteorites that date from this time in our solar system. But one way we could do it is by looking at magnetism, because that pressure maxima corresponds to a peak in the magnetic field as well. So these non-uniformities can serve as catalysts for the entire process of planet building. But accessing that is difficult. But we had a thorough record of the magnetic field and its behavior throughout our protoplanetary disk. We would gain really powerful and unique insights into these features, uh, the nature and when, what created them. So we could really make some big leaps in saying how potentially we build planets and uh, potentially deciphering Earth's origin. Now, I'm not going to go into the details right now, but we believe that we can gain an access to this magnetic field record by studying particularly ancient meteorites, those that recorded a magnetic field within the first four to five million years of solar system history. Those meteorites are expected to record uh, disk magnetic fields, whereas ones later could be recording core dynamo fields or other sources of magnetic field. And what I'm showing here is a compilation of measurements that we've been doing on meteorites in the last seven years or so uh, that are showing the paleo intensity as a function of, of time after solar system formation. That's what this term here means. Um, uh, and what I, before I get going into what this figure actually shows, for those people who don't work on meteorites every day, when we have these different groups of chondrites like CO, CM, CR, CV, this meteorite here is also a, a CV, each group we think uh, represent fragments from the same parent asteroid. So there are about 600 CO chondrites, and then we think they are 600 fragments of the same parent asteroid. So we might expect things that have got similar namings on here to show similar magnetic field records. And that's seemingly not the case. In fact, when we look at this trend at face value, we're seeing really large variations in paleo intensity over two orders of magnitude. And also over short time periods, the, in terms of interpreting this record, the two measurements on here that are most straightforward to interpret based on the type of remnants and the measurements we have are, are these two. Uh, and that suggests a really precipitous drop in the magnetic field intensity over a really short amount of time. So if we wanted to look at these data to try and say, did we have a magnetic field maxima in our disk? Did we have a pressure maxima? And was that where planets were forming right now? this is not overly conclusive. But I want to try and shed some light on that, and I'm going to do that today by talking about this group here, the, the CM chondrite. So I'm going to talk about a particularly uh, exciting, a special CM chondrite, which is the Winchcombe CM chondrite. Now, there are a number of reasons why this is a really exciting meteorite, uh, principally because it's the freshest meteorite we have in our global collection. It was picked up within 12 hours of falling. Now, in terms of its magnetism, that's not super critical, but in terms of its organic um, uh, molecule concentration uh, and its water concentration, those are very quickly contaminated on Earth. So from a broad planetary science point of view, this meteorite has been a game changer. Uh, it's also it's really exciting because it's the first meteorite to have fallen in the UK in the last 30 years. And it's one of these CM chondrites, which again, we only have about 600 of. So it's a rare type of meteorite, but we have 70,000 meteorites in total. Um, we have a camera network in the UK that is constantly observing the night sky to look for meteorites when they enter our atmosphere. And on the 28th of February 2021, they all lit up with this fireball streaking across Wales. Uh, and through these, these high resolution uh, advanced cameras, overnight we were able to come up with a prediction of where we think the meteorite should have landed. And really, coincidentally, it was just north of Oxford. So we put out a press release uh, in the morning news saying if at about 10 p.m. last night you saw or heard anything that was a little bit weird, like something crashing around your house, please let us know. Also, if possible, please put on rubber gloves if you have gloves and put it in plastic bags and then put it in the fridge. Um, and a family in Gloucestershire, north of here, heard what they described as someone breaking a pane of glass outside their house at about 10 p.m. So they woke up, heard the local news, and thought they'd check it out. And they found this on their driveway, uh, which is 
as it turns out, a piece of this meteorite. They followed exactly what we said, which was brilliant. Uh, and that night we were at their house to confirm that this was indeed a piece of this meteorite. Now that we knew that we had some of it safely make it to the ground, we sprung into action and went and searched in the March weather in the Cotswolds to look for more of this meteorite. Um, and as sort of a UK wide planet lab based planetary science community, uh, we all sort of pitched together here and we put up a consortium, or we constructed a consortium to study this meteorite in all of its details. And the magnetic measurements are being led out of Oxford, but it's composed or being run at least entirely by early career scientists. It's been this really amazing opportunity to be part of. Within seven days of the meteorite falling, we had over half a kilogram of material, a good portion of that coming from the driveway, and another good portion coming from a big stone that was found in a field, which I showed a picture of on, on the title slide. And to the present day, we've collected just over 600 grams. And this ranges from millimeter sized objects to centimeter sized objects, as well as a whole bunch of powder. To make sure we got as much material as we physically could, we actually even cut up the Wilcock family driveway, and the whole driveway is in the Natural History Museum, uh, just to make sure we can pluck out every bit of powder that's embedded in it. We, we did also replace the driveway. Uh, and this is what it looks like in the SEM. Here I'm showing uh, a chemical map of iron, uh, calcium, magnesium in green, blue, red. Uh, and what we can see is this is a very typical for a CM chondrite. What this meteorite was when it accreted to form its parent asteroid was olivine, pyroxene, various glasses, stoichiometric iron sulfide, iron nickel metal, uh, and a whole bunch of ice. And as that material accreted into a parent asteroid, that started producing heat. The ice melted, reacted with those anhydrous phases to create a range of hydrate or secondary aqueously altered minerals. And that's what we're seeing in this meteorite now. Uh, it's composed predominantly now of phyllosilicates uh, to chilonite, which is a rare uh, uh, hydroxy sulfide that you really only find in this type of meteorite. Uh, carbonates, predominantly calcite, remnant olivine and pyroxene in, in the red grains. And then from a magnetic point of view, it's got magnetite and it's got non-stoichiometric iron sulfide now, so, so pyrotite. And within a month, we had two pieces here in Oxford uh, to do magnetic characterization measurements on. Uh, so we measured hysteresis loops and we measured fork diagrams. Um, I should say that the first paper describing everything to do with this meteorite should hopefully be out in the next month or so uh, in science advances. Um, and what we can see from the fork diagrams of these meteorites, in particular this one on the uh, piece of this meteorite, sorry, particularly this one on the left, is quite a triangular shape. Uh, it's less apparent this one, although it's you can just about see the weak signal down here. Now, sort of going beyond just that qualitative description of a fork diagram, we put these into the new principal component analysis, which has been developed in, in Cambridge Imperial and, and ANU, to quantitatively analyze the variability we're seeing in these forks. Um, so what I'm showing here uh, is the result of that principal component analysis initially for the CM chondrites and another group of extensively aqueously altered chondrites called the CI chondrites. And these data from uh, this compilation study that we published last year in EPSL. And what you can see is that the CM chondrites, when you look at their principal components, they fall largely on a mixing line here between uh, a fork diagram that's got a very nice vortex characteristic shape up to a fork diagram here that's got a very nice single domain shape. So basically these CM chondrites then magnetic carriers can be described as mixtures of varying proportions of vortex state magnetite and single domain magnetite. This group of meteorites here, the CI chondrites, they have a different type of fork diagram. And this is this more triangular shape. They are, the grains are interacting more with each other, spreading the fork diagram vertically. Um, and what we can see is that these are not uh, a natural end member of this trend. It's not like if you continued this trend, you would get to this point here. So magnetite is forming in a different way in these meteorites to these meteorites. And really interestingly, when we add Winchcombe into this, it falls in between the two. And we can say that the two pieces of Winchcombe can be described as a mixture of going somewhere along this line about here and then mixing up by adding in some of this material here. So the Winchcombe meteorite appears to be enormously rich in this end member of material, given it is certainly a CM chondrite. Now, this material here, when we look at it under the microscope, uh, is framboids and plaquettes of magnetite. 
Um, what happened here is we originally had an iron sulfide. That sulfide has been aqueously altered and it dissolved. And then in the void space, magnetite has reprecipitated as these tight clusters of magnetite grains. And then it doesn't show up super clearly in these pictures here, but these plaquettes are stacked platelets of magnetite, which form through a similar process. In the normal CM chondrites, the main form of magnetite was simply that we had iron nickel metal, water comes in and pseudomorphically replaces the metal grain with magnetite. Um, so in Winchcombe, we've got two forms of magnetite forming, one through dissolution and precipitation and one through pseudomorphic replacement, which is anomalous. Most CM chondrites don't show this. Um, so this means that given that these magnetic phases form through aqueous alteration and these meteorites did not experience high peak temperatures, we expect they recorded chemical remnant magnetizations of the disk field or CRMs. And this is the case for any low temperature chondrite, the CM chondrites, CO chondrites, CV chondrites, and any ungrouped low temperature chondrites as well. Now, just before I show the data from Winchcombe, I want to quickly show uh, what most CM chondrites look like in their demagnetization patterns. So I'm showing an orthogonal projection plot over here from a paper from a few years ago now. And we can see that by 100 millitesla, there is a broadly origin trending component, but it's by no means that the origin is not completely demagnetized. Um, and we see that most of the NRM, when you heat it, is lost by about 300 degrees C. And these two uh, results combined suggest that it's uh, a remnant that's predominantly carried by pyrotite. Um, which is kind of interesting because there's certainly magnetite in this meteorite. We see it under the microscope, we see it in XRD, and we also see it in the magnetism as well. There is a signal that demagnetizes above the pyrotite Curie temperature all the way up to the magnetite Curie temperature. So it seems like only the pyrotite is magnetized in this meteorite. And this corresponds to um, a pain intensity of four plus or minus three microtesla, so significantly weaker than Earth's field today corresponding to that value I showed on that compilation a few slides ago. Now, Winchcombe shows something quite different. What I'm showing here, the orthogonal projection plots from three samples of Winchcombe, bulk samples measured in our 2G downstairs in our paleomag lab here, and we're seeing large low coercivity components, medium coercivity components, and then origin trending high coercivity components. The low coercivity components are not unidirectional from sample to sample, whereas the high coercivity components start to become much closer to unidirectional from sample to sample. And we're also seeing them carried up to at least 85 millitesla, so relatively high coercivity um, carriers. We didn't perform any thermal measurements because these meteorites, in my experience at least, alter very, very easily on heating. So we thought, given this was a precious sample, we would AF all of our samples rather than try any thermal demagnetization. But Winchcombe appears to carry a large origin trending high coercivity component, but not to as high, but it extends to relatively high AF values, but not as high as most normal CM chondrites. Looking at equal area plot projections of the different components, we can see that the we have three different types of samples we measured. One is the fusion crust, which is the part of the meteorite that gets really hot when it enters the atmosphere and creates the fireball itself. This melts, so we know this really records Earth's field. We then have a baked zone where we have material from right next to the fusion crust that got warm on Earth but didn't melt, and then the interior, which doesn't appear heated at all. Uh, in the low coast component, the fusion crusted material that will cause Earth field is pointing in a different direction to any of the interior or baked samples. In the medium coercivity, the fusion crust is in a different direction to the low coercivity, and then the other samples seem to fall on, a, on an arc extending away from that to a direction that's sort of south, southeast. And then in high coercivity, we're seeing unidirectionality among the fusion crusted samples, the baked samples, and the interior samples from closest to the fusion crust, but then a completely different direction, which corresponds to an end member on this arc for the high coercivity direction, suggesting that there is a pre-terrestrial primary remnants carried in uh, the, the most interior subsamples inside which, although it was particularly affected by atmospheric entry, we were able to see through that in most of our subsamples. The low coercivity component is almost certainly a terrestrial VRM. The MC component appears to be a mixture between that terrestrial overprint and the high coercivity component, and the high coercivity component appears to be a primary pre-terrestrial signal. We did uh, ARM uh, paleo intensity determination uh, among all of our subsamples, uh, and we're seeing stronger values than what we saw in the normal CM chondrites as well, sort of uh, somewhere between about 10 and 20 microtesla for our samples. 
uh, here's a compilation of all of the samples that showed relatively high quality demagnetization, and we get an, out an average value of 15 and a half microtesla. Now, if this parent asteroid was recording its magnetization during aqueous alteration, and the disk field was in a, a constant orientation and this body was spinning, that means we record on average, depending on the, the tilt of the spin axis, half a pay attention that's half the value of the background field. So to correct for that, we have to double the value we recover. So we propose that the nebula field recorded by the winter meteorite was 31 microtesla. And according to some work that Les did a few years ago now, the magnetite grains inside these framboids, the predominant magnetic carrier in these meteorites, have relaxation times of millions of billions of years. So we believe that because it doesn't appear to be an overprint on Earth, that this should be a primary signature that reflects the magnetic field recorded by uh, which came during the very early solar system during equatorial duration when this magnetite formed. Now we can add that to that compilation I showed earlier. And if anything, rather than making things more straightforward, I've, 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 I've complicated things more. I expected it to fall on top of the meteorites that come from the same group and it's an order of magnitude stronger, which was not what I was hoping for. I was hoping for a relatively straightforward story to talk about a fresh meteorite. And uh, we got something that we weren't expecting. Um, so given we have this new observation, we, we, we proposed a theory as to why that might be. And it's sort of really illuminating to think about the magnetic carriers we have in each of these meteorites. So just adding those on, in these meteorites that recorded stronger intensities, they will have primary iron nickel metal as their magnetic recorder. Winchcombe has got cramboidal magnetite, that magnetite that forms a pseudomorphic replacement, and pyrotite. The CM chondrites, the normal ones, have magnetite that forms a pseudomorphic replacement and pyrotite. And then these two just have magnetite. So it's interesting that there seems to be a correlation between what the magnetic primary magnetic carrier is and the paleo intensity it records. So that led us to propose a model. Let's imagine that we've got our uh, pre alteration magnetic assemblage, which in the in a CM contract, a typical one would be grains of metal that are non unidirectionally magnetized alongside stoichiometric uh, iron sulfide troilite, which is also non magnetic, uh, which is non magnetic, and which can look similar. A normal CM contract then undergoes aqueous alteration. Uh, the metal reacts with water to create magnetite, and the troilite reacts with water to create pyrotite. Now, it's possible that the magnetite inherits the remnants from its parent metal. That's been observed in other CRMs recorded in terrestrial samples before. That can't be the case for pyrotite because the parent phase is non-magnetic. So it's possible that if there is a weak background field shown here by the gray arrows, that the magnetite doesn't care. It doesn't see that because it's inheriting the remnants from its parent metal, whereas the pyrotite does because the parent's non-magnetic. In Winchcombe, we have the same thing happening with the metal, but when the framboidal magnetite forms, uh, in, when it replaces the troilite, that forms through dissolution and reprecipitation. So that can't inherit any parent metal because it's not forming through pseudomorphic replacement now. It's forming through a new magnetite grain that forms through precipitation. So that's much more likely to correspond to a classical CRM where we would record the background field. Now, the problem we have in all of these meteorites is when we go into the lab and we magnetize them to get our calibration ARM measurement, we magnetize everything because we have to. We have to apply magnetic field to the whole sample, which magnetizes all the magnetite and all the pyrotite. And this means that when we do our ARM period intensity determination, in a typical CM chondrite, we're demagnetizing, when we demagnetize the ARM, both pyrotite and magnetite, whereas when we demagnetize the NRM, we're only demagnetizing pyrotite, which is a small magnetic, it's got a low susceptibility and uh, has a low magnetization. So the change we see in our y-axis measurement is going to be way less than what we see in our x-axis measurement. And that's going to shallow our slope and give us a weak paleo intensity, far lower than what could have actually been the background field at the time. And the same is true in Winchcombe, but to less of an extent. Here, the pyrotite and the framboid are magnetite are magnetized but we're still magnetizing the pseudomorphic magnetite when we do our lab calibration, which gives us a steeper slope, but still doesn't match that one-to-one -one we'd expect uh, if we'd applied the right the natural field strength when we did our ARM calibration. So what I did was some back of the envelope calculations to basically say, is the amount of framboid magnetite we have in Winchcombe consistent with 
the pain intensity we measure. And we can get out a quantitative measure of the, framboid, the proportion of framboid magnetite we have from those fork diagrams I showed earlier. And what we can basically say is, if we have um, uh, an original field that was 77 microtesla, if we record about half of that, because about half magnetite is framboid magnetite, that would give us this 31 microtesla value we measure. So we have this back in the envelope calculation based on susceptibility uh, that says the magnetic field should do this as a function of how much framboid or plaquette magnetite is in there. And for the value we measure independently for fork diagrams, that overlaps what we measure in our paleo intensity. Uh, if we then take that 77 microtesla value and we calculate the field we would measure in a normal CM chondrite, one that has only pseudomorphic replacement magnetite and pyrotite, that would give us um, the, this sort of contour diagram here where I'm showing the proportion of magnetite possible and the proportion of pyrotite possible, highlighting in the lighter colors the more likely values we get from XRD measurements of these meteorites. We can see that we are, for a nominal 2.5% of pyrotite and magnetite, we are recreating the four microtesla value almost perfectly that we measure in these meteorites. So it looks like no CM chondrite is actually able to record the intensity of its background field because only a portion of its magnetic minerals are able to record a magnetization. But when we account for that proportion, all CM chondrites are consistent with a 77 microtesla value. Now, meteorites that have neither pyrotite nor framboid magnetite would look like they weren't magnetized in this scenario, even if there was a field. Uh, and that becomes important. Oh, sorry, I should say, I proposed this theory that does framboid and plaquette magnetite have a different pain magnetic to pseudomorphic magnetite? And if so, why? And I haven't been able to support that with a concrete observation because it doesn't exist yet. But we have our new quantum diamond microscope, our GeoQDM, operating fully in Oxford now. It's running as I speak, looking into this problem. So hopefully in a few months' time, I'll be able to give you concrete observations that support this. Now, when we account for the paleo intensity that we measure in these meteorites and the, their proportion of framboid magnetite or pyrotite, we can say all the CM chondrites actually correct this value of 77. And then these two meteorites, which don't have pyrotite and don't have any framboid magnetite, just weren't able to record a magnetic field. So we can drop them from our record. And we immediately get a much more straightforward record where we're just seeing a strong magnetic field as a function of time among the carbonaceous chondrites of around 80 to 100 microtesla or so. So although Winchcombe initially seemed to be a complicated meteorite that didn't agree with anything else, using its anomalous mineralogy, we've kind of actually been able to propose a new model that appears to clarify quite a few issues and the magnetic field in the carbonaceous chondrite formation region solar system appears strong. Now, uh, we've been over the last so 10 years doing a lot of isotopic measurements of meteorites. And when we look at their nuclear synthetics, we can see that all meteorites fall into two families, the carbonaceous chondrites up here, which I've been talking about today, and the non-carbonaceous down here. And this difference in isotopic compositions strongly supports a bifurcation of our disk. Our protoplanetary disk was separated into two somehow, and they had two isotopically distinct evolving reservoirs. And we think that this reservoir, the carbonaceous, uh, originates from further away from the sun, and this reservoir, the non-carbonaceous, from closer to the sun. And what I'm just going to show you to finish up the talk is uh, the paleo intensity recovered from a non-carbonaceous meteorite that formed closer to the sun, and our new sort of 90 microtesla value that the carbonaceous chondrites are pointing towards. And what we can immediately see, this is this prediction I showed for the magnetic field intensity on a previous slide, is that the carbonaceous chondrite meteorites don't agree with this prediction. They are twice as strong as a non-carbonaceous meteorites and about three times as strong as their predicted nominal magnetic field intensity. And there are several ways of explaining this, but one of them could be if we did indeed have a pressure maxima. It meant that our disk's magnetic field looked something like this. If we had a pressure maxima that would concentrate magnetic field lines and potentially explain this factor of two difference we're seeing in the magnetic field intensity. So just to conclude, the Winchcombe meteorite carries a unidirectional high coercivity remnants that appears to be a primary signature from the early solar system. This corresponds to a comparatively strong magnetic field of 31 microtesla, uh, which is about an order of magnitude stronger than we see recorded from other CM chondrites. And we can start to propose a way of explaining this difference um, by thinking about the mineralogy, and it suggests that the intensity of the magnetic field 
was strong in the carbonaceous reservoir in our solar system. And when we combine that with all the other meteorites that we've got so far, they're all consistently pointing towards this idea that the carbonaceous meteorites recorded a particularly strong magnetic field, which could most readily be explained by heterogeneity or some sort of pressure maxima inside of our protomatic disk, which could shed some really valuable light on environments that led to planet formation. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you very much, James. Uh, uh, there are many <laughs> applauses for you. Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting talk. Um, there is now room for some questions. I see Wynne raise his hand. Just please go ahead. Hi, James. Wow, what a fantastic talk. Ah, oh, gosh, I don't know. I, I mean, I've got loads of things that come to my mind. So uh, just on a technical thing, I'm always slightly suspicious about PCM modeling because it depends upon your end states, right? Mm. Your, your, and and I, I personally am not convinced uh, about, I don't think it really, it doesn't actually alter any of your conclusions, but the, the identification of a vortex state from vortex from fork diagrams, I think is pretty dubious. Uh, if you have some uh, single domains and some interactions, then I think, uh, you can get a very similar characteristic. Um, but uh, the, the rest of the questions I have are really because of my lack of knowledge. Uh, I mean, I, so um, the, uh, the, you're saying that the uh, carbonaceous chondrites always form further out in the protoplasmic disk. Is that what you said? Yeah, and I should have, I, it slipped my mind to say exactly why we think that. They have a higher amount of, uh, phyllosilicates and secondary phases at the present day, which means we think they had more solid ice incorporated when they accreted, right. and solid ice is stable further away in the disk where it's cooler. So it's okay. to do with the amount of um, water we think is in the meteorites and how the function ice varies as a function of temperature its stability. And the reason why the uh, solar field or the, the uh, protoplasmic magnetic field is it varies with the density of um, nebular material it is because of some ionization or something. It's it? to do with both both an ionization factor and also the, um, the the magnetic field sort of has a you can think about a magnetic pressure that it exerts a force and there's also a force from the the temperature uh, in the disk as well and those two balance each other uh, and they, they they all depend on on the pressure. I guess oh. you can think about it as if you had something like a uh, like a like a solenoid, if you have a material that can attract magnetic flux lines, they will go into that. So you just have more dense material that amplifies the field. Okay, well, I, for some reason I never knew that, so that's amazing. So the, the last thing I have, to, just a question, is um, this, uh, which is critical to your interpretation, is the uh, the origin of the remnants and, and whether material can inherit the original yep. magnetization. Yep. So that, that's that's what I would when when you emailed me earlier. That's the question yeah. I want to propose to the to the community. Right. I have invoked this um, based on my observation, and it appears to correlate, but I don't have the evidence to support it right now. As I said, we've got our QDM, and we're measuring clusters of magnetite that forms a pseudomorphic replacement and framboidin magnetite, and seeing if there if all of the uh, pseudomorphic magnetite is non-unidirectional if all the framboid is unidirectional. That would be a nice bit of smoking gun evidence. We've got another set of um, experiments planned, but what I'd love to see is anyone who's got some sort of um, uh, any way of modeling this, having a metal grain, looking at its magnetization and changing that into magnetite and seeing what can be inherited through that transition. Well, that'd be really cool. I think that's something that we're definitely able to do. And Jose, who is... Uh... A student of uh, Tom Burns, who's who's here at the moment, I can see, uh, he's doing that that exactly that for the tainite and tetratainite. Yes, yeah, yeah. And, we uh, but actually, well. the um, there's something definitely we could do for the framboiders. That would be really interesting to see uh, what, or if that is able to inherit. Um, and you said that, and of course, the the pyrotite doesn't. But um, yeah, so that that was uh, that was really cool. I mean, just an amazing. Uh, Set of set of data and that story that you've built around it just amazing. I I, I don't think I'm ever going to be as fortuitous in my career again as having a meteorite land 
uh, basically on my doorstep that really helps clarify this complicated picture that we've been building in the last seven or eight years. That's it's just not going to happen again. I, I feel very I feel very privileged. Yeah, but fantastic work, James. Really impressed. Thanks, Thanks. Wynne. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Greg, you have your hand up. Yeah. Uh, thanks, James. For the, as Wynne said, that was a really good talk. I mean, I guess actually um, my question kind of falls on a little bit from, from what Wynne was talking about. I mean, um, how exactly are you calibrating your paleo intensity? So you're using an ARM uh, based method, which are almost all calibrated, assuming that the NRM is a thermal remnant magnetization, but, but you don't have that, you have a CRM. So uh, how are you doing the calibration and, and how might that actually impact um, um, your, your intensity estimate? You're absolutely right. So we are, uh, again, basically due to a lack of, of really concrete observations, we're assuming that the CRM is the same as a TRM. And there are, you know, Buffy McClellan did some very prelim measurements back in the 90s that suggest the long time periods, that ratio of um, NRM, uh, CRM to TRM is, is closer to one, but we don't have the measurements to, to back that up. We're, again, we're starting a set of projects uh, in a few months that are, are going to be doing that explicitly for lab altered meteorites. Take anhydrous meteorites, put them in water, then measure their magnetization. So we'll get an idea, we'll get a calibration. Uh, but for in the time being, we're using that value of one. For the ARM to TRM ratio, um, we're using a factor of 3.3, uh, which is the average that people have measured from calibration studies in the past. So you're absolutely right. We don't we don't have um, as much data yet to, to give the really concrete values we want. I guess uh, a really interesting thing is, um, regardless of the calibration factors, the CM chondrites can be compared to each other in a relative sense. And we're still seeing an order of magnitude more in this meteorite. Um, and um, that order of magnitude is consistent with the proportion of framboid magnetite we're seeing in, in this meteorite. So I think even if the numbers end up moving around, that relativity, the fact that this is a order of magnitude stronger, will still stand. And that's one of the key, the key observations, I, I, I think. It'd be cool to, to, to look at that uh, CRM TRM ratio from a modeling perspective as well, James. Absolutely, it's absolutely. Yeah. That would yeah. be really cool to look at. Yeah. Definitely. Thank you uh, for your question. Thanks. Um, is there any other question from the audience? Right. So um, let's give James another big round of applause. Thanks for presenting to my minutes. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm going to share last few slides with you. So um, we'd like to remind you that our next talk is going to be on the 19th of October from Jeff Lerner. And then in November, we have two dates, a Joe Mertz, and then keep it, uh, we keep you updated on the mailing list. So please subscribe to that if you haven't. And if you have missed the past seminar or you want to catch up with this, watch it and rewatch it, please follow us and like uh, the YouTube page. You can cite also the, the talks uh, through a GUI. And, and so thanks uh, again for joining us and uh, see you next time. <laughs>